Hello, my name is Ijeoma Onwenu Tibo. I'm a professor of microbiology at Montgomery College. So this lecture series uh, is for the Bio 210 general microbiology classes here at Takuma Park Silver Spring Campus. Hello class, uh, we're here again. Uh, today we're going to be talking about uh, principles of disease and epidemiology. Uh, this is chapter 14 of your book and you all got the uh, notes before you came to the class so I'm expecting you to read on and then bring questions as we continue to uh, tackle the various chapters. Now, there are key terms for us to look at. Uh, before we actually get into uh, uh, the main lecture. So, when we talk about pathology, pathology, anytime you hear ology, means study. Pathos in Greek means disease. So, pathology is the study of diseases. And then when we talk about etiology, ology again, study, etio, that is studying the cause of the disease, what is causing the disease. Then we also have pathogenesis. Pathogenesis is the ability of an organism to cause disease. Infection. Infection simply means colonization of the body by pathogens and of course, like we discussed before, pathogens are organisms that cause infection. Then disease itself is an abnormal state in which the body is not functioning, not functional at all or not functioning normally. I hope you actually look at these uh, key terms and make sure you understand them. So having said that, in discussing epidemiology, we must not forget to talk about the normal microbiota and the relationship of the normal microbiota to the host, the host being you and I. There are different kinds of normal microbiota. The first one is transient microbiota. And this refers to organisms that stay in a particular place for a few days, weeks, or months, and then they move on, as opposed to normal microbiota, which are organisms that permanently colonize the host. I'll give you an example. Once a child is born, and the child breathes in, all the organisms that will colonize the intestines and the internal portions of the body will be in place. Now, we do have relationships among organisms, and I want to talk about them because they jive and are in concert with some of the relationships we're going to be talking about in this chapter. Symbiosis is relationship among organisms, not just relationship among organisms and the normal microbiota, but relationships among organisms in general. There are key ones that I will hold you responsible for. One of them is commensalism. Commensalism is a relationship between two organisms where one organism benefits and the other one is not affected. <laughs> the other one doesn't even realize there's somebody else benefiting from them. That's commensalism. And I'll give you an example. Commensalism, uh, the example that I have right on hand, you look at whales, whales that live in the ocean. Whales are so huge, there are some little fish riding on their back, picking up parasites from their back. The whales don't even know that they're there, so they're not bothered. And that's commensalism because they fish that is riding on the back is enjoying and the whale <laughs> couldn't even be bothered doesn't even know they're there that's commensalism 
mutualism is a relationship where the two organisms benefit. And I'll go ahead and give you an, an example of that. The E. coli that lives in the large intestines of humans, they have where to live in our intestines, large intestines, and at the same time, E. coli synthesizes vitamin K for us. Vitamin K is necessary for blood clotting. So you see that us and E. coli, we need each other mutually. We need them and they need us to have somewhere to stay. We need them to synthesize vitamin K. Now, bringing it to application, this is the situation among, between husband and wife. Although some of us, mine is parasitism. <laughs> Just for you to, you know, loosen out and laugh. So moving on from mutualism, there's parasitism. Parasitism is when one organism enjoys and benefits at the detriment of the other organism. All these parasites that we dealt with in chapter 12, the worms, the uh, giardia lamblia, all of those ones are parasites. They enjoy at our detriment. They end up, if not taken care of, end up killing us, okay? Now, some normal microbiota can also be opportunistic pathogens. What do I mean? Opportunistic pathogens are those organisms that under normal circumstances, when your immune system is competent and not compromised, they cannot cause problems. However, once your immune system is compromised, they swing into action and they can cause problems. An example is Pseudomonas aeruginosa, Pseudomonas aeruginosa lives in the soil and they, it's just there. If your immune system is competent and you're well, it shouldn't cause any problem in you. However, let's say for instance you have burns, fire burns, and then your first, uh, 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 first uh, how do I say, your skin is broken. Pseudomonas aeruginosa can cause serious infection that can kill a burnt patient. To get it uh, clearer, we women, this is micro of course, we women, we have some organisms such as the yeast in our vaginal area. Under normal circumstances, those yeasts don't cause any problem. Candida albicans, they don't cause problems. However, once your immune system is compromised or you're pregnant, and there's a shift in the acidity of the vaginal area, you can come down with yeast infection. Again, if you're on antibiotics and it kills those lactobacillus that live in the vaginal area that protects us, when they are killed, the yeast infection will rear its ugly side and then we start having issues. Those are opportunistic. Moving right along, uh, there are areas of the body that we don't have normal microbiota. I'll give an example. The lung, the lower respiratory system, which is the, the lungs and the bronchioles, are free of normal microbiota. They're sterile. That area is sterile. However, in the mouth, we have organisms that live there as normal microbiota. Also, in the eyes, the conjunctiva, the upper respiratory system, the nose, the mouth, and the urogenital system of both males and females. These areas harbor normal microbiota. Once a child is born, all the organisms will go in and colonize these areas. Now, let's see the relationship, actual relationship, and the, 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 the um, some of the how these work with normal microbiota, okay, these relationships. We have a phenomenon we call microbial antagonism. Microbial antagonism is a competition between microorganisms. Again, I'm going to use the example of the vaginal areas of female. We have some bacteria that live in that area 
that likes an acidic environment and they make that area acidic environment and it's for our own benefit in the sense that they will synthesize sugar to acid so that other organisms that are in that environment that ordinary would cause problems are kept in check especially with regards to yeast so that phenomenon of those organisms making sure that other organisms in that area don't rear their ugly heads that phenomenon is called microbial antagonism okay and what those organisms do is to compete for food and then produce acids and all kinds of chemicals to make sure that other organisms that normally would cause problems don't cause problems. Okay, moving along, recall first, uh, during the first week that we met, we talked about Koch's postulates. You cannot discuss epidemiology without, without referring to Koch's postulates. Koch's postulates, or rather, Robert Koch, was the guy that experimentally proved that specific organisms cause specific diseases. And those experimental steps to prove that is what we call Koch's postulates. Now, Koch's postulates states that the same organism that caused the disease must always be present any time that disease is present. Number two, that that pathogen must always be isolated from that individual and grown in culture. And that that grown organism in culture must be inoculated into a non-diseased animal and must produce the same signs and symptoms. And then that recently inoculated animal must die of the same signs and symptoms before you can prove that that particular organism causes that particular disease. That is what we call Koch's postulates. As we move along, we're going to develop this further and actually talk about it more in detail. So Koch's postulates is summarized as tools or rather experimental steps used to prove the cause of an infectious disease. However, as in everything in life, some pathogens or some disease causing organisms do not play to the rule. Why do I say that? Koch's postulate says that the organism must be isolated, the same organism must be isolated in each case of that disease and must be grown in culture. There are some organisms that you can't grow in culture, so they don't conform to the Koch's postulates. And others do not cause the same disease. I'll give you an example. Streptococcus pyogenes causes four different types of diseases. So in that case, it's not going to conform to the Koch's postulates. But then most organisms do conform. So it's still a win-win situation. That takes us to classifi classification of infectious diseases. We have to classify infectious diseases. And there are key terms that I'm going to be holding responsible for the upcoming exam during this unit. First of all is the symptom. Symptom is a change in body function that is felt by the patient. Only the patient feels it. Okay? An example will be when, when you have a feeling of malaise, what do I mean? You're neither here nor there. You're not sick. You're not well. You don't know. You're just feeling out of sorts. It cannot be measured by a physician. You just don't feel good. That's an example of symptom. However, when we call it sign, signs is when the change in body can be measured and observed and can actually result to a disease. I'll give you an example. Example would be when your blood pressure rises, that can be you know, uh, uh, measured by a physician. Another thing is um, when you have a headache, the doctor will say between one to 10, how is, the, how is the headache? And another thing is to maybe check your sugar levels. Those are signs. 
So you, you can now see the, the difference between symptom and signs. One is objective, the other one is subjective. Symptoms, you cannot quantify, you cannot measure. Signs, you can. Then syndrome is another way of classifying infectious diseases. Syndrome, when a specific group of signs and symptoms accompany a particular disease. I'll give you an example. Children that have Down syndrome, whether those children are uh, Asians, whether they are Caucasians, whether they are African Americans, whether they are Blacks, whether they are Chinese, they all look alike. Because this, they have the same signs and symptoms. So it's called Down syndrome. It's a syndrome. Another example would be with people with AIDS. They are always losing weight. You see the, the, the weight loss. And then they have this Kaposi's sarcoma, which is end-state cancer that accompanies that disease. So when specific group of signs and symptoms accompany a disease, it is known as syndrome. Then, when we talk about communicable diseases, communicable diseases are diseases that go from one host to another. An example, we have so many examples. HIV, AIDS, uh, uh, malaria. Uh, there's so many, so many infectious diseases. Even, um, what are the examples? I'm sure some of you can think of more examples than I can. But when you talk about contagious disease, contagious diseases are communicable disease, but it has to be gotten by contact. An example would be leprosy, okay? Chicken pox, these are all contagious. There has to be contact. But when we talk about non-communicable diseases, diseases that cannot pass from one host to another, example would be cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure. These are non-communicable diseases because they cannot be transmitted from one host to another. Okay? Then, in looking at the occurrence of diseases, there are key terms that we must understand before we can move forward with this particular theme. Incidence is one. Incidence is when fraction of a population contracts a disease during a specific time. Fraction of a population contracts a disease during a specific time. Prevalence is when fraction of a population having a specific disease at a given time. There's a difference between those things, albeit a thin line of difference. But when we talk about sporadic diseases, we talk about diseases that occur occasionally in a population. An example will be uh, 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 Ebola comes once every 15 years, once every 10 years, okay? So this is an example of sporadic. Sporadic disease occurs occasionally in a population. But when we talk about endemic disease, endemic disease is a disease that, that is constantly present in a population. I come from West Africa, Nigeria. Anytime you go to West Africa or to Nigeria, malaria is there. It's endemic in that region of the world. So endemic diseases are diseases that are constantly present in a particular population. Then when we talk about epidemic disease, we're talking about disease acquired by many hosts in a given area in a short time, like when you have typhoid. And also, I might add, AIDS has risen to epidemic levels. When we talk about pandemic disease, pandemic disease is worldwide. It's found in every part of the world, like AIDS. And then herd immunity is the immunity in most of a population. So these key terms I want you to look at closely. And then if you have difficulties, please email me or 
come see me during my office hours. So moving right along, we now want to look at the severity or duration of a disease in the context of epidemiology. There are key terms, again, because for us to understand the concepts that I'm going to present in this particular unit, you have to understand the key terms. When we talk about acute disease, an acute disease is a disease that the symptoms develop rapidly. Whereas a chronic disease is disease that develops slowly and lasts for a long time. There's a difference here now. But in some cases, not in all diseases, we do have subacute disease, which has symptoms between acute and chronic, subacute. Then we do have latent, latent disease. Latent diseases are diseases that, with, that have a period of no symptoms at all, okay? And at that point in time, the causative agent or the pathogen is inactive. An example would be herpes. Herpes. Herpes type 2. Herpes zoster. For some, occasionally you have a crisis and then it becomes inactive and then it comes up again. That's an example of latent disease. And then now we're going to look at the extent of host involvement in disease acquisition and actually uh, how you know uh, diseases occur. We have what we call local infection. Local infection are uh, when the pathogens or the causative agents are only in a small area. They're in a small area. I'll give you an example. The boil you have under your armpit by Staphylococcus aureus is an example of a local infection. Then when we talk about systemic infection, is infection that has gone throughout the body, systemic, as opposed to local. Local is just in a small area, okay? But systemic has gone all over the body. Then focal infection, focal, is an infection that starts as a local infection and then becomes systemic. An example is when you have surgery. And then from that surgical point, there's infection, and then it goes wild. Still talking about extent of host involvement. When we say that, that an infection is septic, it simply means that there's some kind of spread of microorganisms, okay? When an infection becomes septic, there's been contamination by microorganisms. When we talk about bacteremia, any time you hear emia has to do with blood. So when you hear bacteremia, it means infection or bacteria in the blood. But the fact that bacteria is in the blood and it's not spreading, that, that condition can also uh, be found. So when there's just bacteria in the blood and it hasn't spread, it's referred to as bacteremia. However, Bacteremia can lead to septicemia. Septicemia is when the bacteria in the blood has started dividing. And of course, that is very, very dangerous in the sense that septicemia most times leads to death because the organisms are now multiplying in the blood and carry it to ectopic sites like the brain, the heart, and all of that. Okay? So there's a difference between bacteremia, septicemia, okay? And then we have toxemia. Toxemia, emia, blood, toxins in the blood. Toxins are poisons produced by bacteria. Viremia is viruses in the blood. And we have primary infection. Primary infection 
is the infection that took you to the hospital in the first place. Primary infection is what took you to the hospital in the first place. While in the hospital, sometimes you can acquire a secondary infection by opportunistic pathogens. Okay? So, primary infection is acute infection that caused the initial illness, and secondary infection is by opportunistic pathogen, and that comes because your immune system is already compromised. So you are now predisposed to other infections. Then we have subclinical infection. These are infections with no noticeable signs or symptoms. You don't feel anything. I'll give you an example. Trichomonas vaginalis is an S STD, sexually transmitted a disease. The males, when they have it, they don't feel anything, no itching, but when the males, the females have it, they itch. And then, if they tell their partners they're itching, their partners say, I'm not itching, so I don't know what you're talking about. And then those partners will become reservoirs of infection. In other words, they become constant source continual source of infection. Each time their wives get treated, they go back to the husband, they pick it up again. Because in the male, it's subclinical disease. There's no symptoms and signs. So they don't feel they have anything. Take note of that. Now, one would wonder, I'll give you this case scenario. There are six of you children born to a family and then one of you go to school. You know how kids come back from school, bring, you know, some one kind of infection or the other, cold or whatever. How come some people get the infection, others don't? This is what is going to lead me to our next concept, which is predisposing factors that make you vulnerable to picking up infection. And there are several factors that will predispose you to infectious diseases. Let's talk about that. The first factor is gender. Are you a male? Are you a female? Without being um, too much, uh, without going into too much graphic, but I told you this class is graphic because sometimes we cannot coin the word for the male part or the female part. So we all understand, and everybody here, as you have, as I've looked at this, the signature and the forms you filled for my class, are all adults above 18. Males have an anatomy that allows them, they don't have to sit down to use the bathroom to pee or to do the number two, if you know what I mean. But we females have a short urethra that most times we have to sit. So we are more predisposed to picking up organisms through our vaginal area than males. If you look at males, the instrument is long enough that they don't have to touch anything, they just put it out there and they do what they gotta do. So that's gender as a factor to being predisposed to get certain diseases. The second one is genetic. Do you have underlying illnesses in your family? Do some of you have sickle cell anemia? In my family, we have Graves' disease. It has to do with the thyroid gland. So if you do have inherited traits like that, that can also be a predisposing factor to making you sick than others. Then climate and weather. In this country, during the winter is cold flu you worry about. But in the summer, there are other, other um, pathogens you worry about. Where I come from is warm, moist, and you will have a lot of worms and protozoa, protozoal infections. So that's how climate and weather can predispose you to getting, to getting certain diseases or infections. Another thing is fatigue. Students, I'm referring to all of you. You want to do uh, AMP, you want to do microbiology, you want to do 
uh, pathophysiology, or you want to become a nurse in one day. So you pack on all of these courses that require strenuous exercise in the sense that, and let me tell you students one thing, physical fatigue is better than brain fatigue. When, you're, when you have brain fatigue, during an exam, you're looking for the spelling of is. You're going to go E-E-S, E-S-E. It's something you know, I-S. But this is to tell you that when you overload yourself with too many courses at the same time, many times it's difficult for you to do a good job of one of them. This is an advice. So fatigue, when you're fatigued, you can't seem to get in much. That's how fatigue, and you can get sick because your system will be compromised. The next one is age. When we have infection in the community, the two people we worry about are the elderly and the infants. Infants, because their immune system has not kicked in. It gets to three months for their immune system to start working. Adult, I mean, aged, because as you grow older, your thyroid, where the T cells that fight for you are programmed, gets smaller and smaller. By the age of 70, it disappears. So this is how age predisposes you to getting infection. The next one is lifestyle. Are you sticking to one sex partner with regards to STDs? Or are you all over the place? Lifestyle can become a problem. Can predispose you to getting STDs and even HIV AIDS. And Ebola as well. Okay? Another factor is chemotherapy. Are you undergoing radiation because you have cancer or something? That also suppresses your immune system. And makes you makes you predisposed to any any kind of disease. If you see people with AIDS, their immune system is so compromised that they have to be careful. You know, because any little infection, they pick it up because they don't have any defense system anymore. Habits: Do you wash your hands when you go to the bathroom? Habits can predispose you. You go to the bathroom, do what you got to do. You don't wash your hands. You, you have your pizza, you put in your hands and start eating pizza. That's a no-no. That would predispose you to getting serious infections. Now, we do have the stages of a disease. There are, there's at least five stages. The first one is incubation period. The incubation period is the time the organisms got into you. At that time, there are no symptoms, no signs. But after a day or so, you have the next period, which is called the prodromal period. That prodromal period, you start getting mild signs and symptoms. Then the next stage will be period of illness. Once you get into that period of illness, that's where you have the most severe signs and symptoms. It's either you get cured at that point because the signs and symptoms are so severe, severe, you have to have an intervention. It's either you get cured or you die during that period. Hopefully, most people will get intervention at that point, but that's when the most severe signs and symptoms occur. Then the next one, after you now get an intervention, the next period is period of decline, when the signs and symptoms start coming down, okay? During this period of decline, you can still get infected by patho secondary pathogens, okay? But if you get through this period of decline, the signs and symptoms are down, However, if somebody is suffering from entamoeba or amoebic dysentery caused by entamoeba histolytica, they will still be passing out cysts of that organism. And if, you, if that cyst gets into your water or food, 
you come down with something. So at that point of period of decline, the illness is not over, over. Until you get to the next stage, which is the period of convalescence. The period of convalescence is when all signs and symptoms gone and you're just trying to rebuild your system. The cells are trying to get past the, 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 the crisis period and to get back to normal. Okay, so these are the uh, stages of infection. Now, we do have reservoirs of infection. As I said earlier, some human beings can constitute reservoirs of infection for others. And we do have also non-living reservoirs of infection. I'll just go with the first one, okay? Like people with HIV AIDS, they can become carriers. They've not come down with full-blown AIDS, but they're carrying the virus, and they can give it to others. Also, like I said, with the amoebic dysentery or amoebiasis, if you're passing out cysts, even though you feel okay and feel seemingly well, but the pathogens are still there. You become carriers, but you can infect others. Okay? And in that case, sometimes it becomes a latent disease. It's just there, waiting to be passed on. Then, looking at some children have pets, their pets become reservoirs of infection for them. Sometimes they get something from their pet, rabies or whatever, they go to the hospital, they treat them. When they come back, get back to their pets, the pet will give it to them again. So the pet becomes an animal source of constant infection. Okay? And we have also soil, soil tetanus. Anytime you have tetanus and you cure it, you go back barefoot to the soil with old wounds, you're not wearing shoes or anything, those spores can get back into the old wounds and still cause the infection. So the soil becomes a continual source of infection, a reservoir of infection. Yeah? So um, we have different types of transmission of disease, and we're going to be rounding up very soon. So bear with me. And uh, like I said, if you have any questions, feel free to email me. And also, you can swing by my, off by my office. Don't wait till you have an appointment. I don't do appointments. Just swing in and we'll talk about it. But let me also tell you that we have transmission of diseases methods. We have direct transmission. Okay. Direct transmission will require close association with the individual. Okay. And of course, indirect is when it's spread by formites. Formites are inanimate objects, like your tabletops, when you do not clean well, okay? Syringes are formites. You can get infection through syringes as well. And then, of course, we have droplets, airborne droplets, when you sneeze, but you do not cover your sneeze. It's a problem. You can infect others, right? And uh, we have vehicle transmission from food, sandwich. That sandwich that is looking so good. You never know who, who didn't cut their nails well and they're harboring organisms on their nails and they put it there, you're eating it away and enjoying it. Later on, you will be going to stool, you'll be stooling all over the place and vomiting. Fulminating diarrhea, okay? We will stop at this place today, and then we will continue when next we met. We're going to, when next we meet, sorry, and we're going to be talking about vectors that are associated with diseases. And albeit, there are some vectors that we also uh, categorize as vectors of medical importance. Those are the ones that carry diseases. Some of them you've met in uh, chapter 12, like mosquitoes, ticksy fly that carries African sleeping sickness, and uh, uh, tick that carries Rocky Mountain Spotted Fever, okay? So I'll see you again next time. Please keep studying, bring in the questions, and swing by to see me. Don't feel that your questions are, uh, uh, don't make sense. There is no question that doesn't make sense in my class. Just bring it on and we'll talk. Thank you, and we'll see you again.